Today, uh, we are celebrating the rite of election for our catechumens that are here. And uh, after the gospel and the homily, they will be invited to come up and sign a book. And it's uh, the best way I'm describing it is <clears throat> that they are going to sign on the dotted line. And you all know what that means. If you buy a car or a house or anything that's very expensive, it, until you sign on the dotted line, there's no contract yet. But once you do, it's a, you're in trouble, okay? You, you, you own it. So uh, they are saying today they believe they're ready to be received into the church fully in the sacraments of initiation, baptism, confirmation, and first Eucharist. And they are signing on the dotted line. And after today, we will call them the elect, that they have been elected or chosen by God to receive the sacraments and to be fully initiated. So uh, we will be moving toward that shortly. But before we get there, we need to reflect on these scriptures. Uh, Jesus was led by the Spirit into the desert. Why? Why? What is the point of this? Well, it gets interesting, okay? Now, <clears throat> I need to first treat the first and second reading that references Noah and the ark. I will say as a little boy in Catholic school, uh, we had these beautiful Bible storybooks with beautiful pictures, and I remember the ark there with two of every animal on it. And, and even then as a kid in second grade, I found that a little hard to believe. How could anyone build an ark so big that two of every animal, all the beasts, would come on board? And why wouldn't they eat each other and tear each other apart? And then they're there for 40 days floating on the, in the sea, and, and I'm sorry, someone has to say it, they make poo-poo and pee-pee, don't they? Just like everything else. And that causes dysentery. That causes all kinds of illness. So it's, it's, it's a story that doesn't make sense. But more than that, the most disturbing thing about this story is I remember that God with Abraham made a promise. And we heard in the response to he doesn't break his promises. He says what he means and he does it. And then he said he would make Abraham's children and descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and the sands on the shore of the sea. And he would protect them always, love them always. And so in this story of knowing the ark, he kills every human being on earth except for eight people. What is this? Does that make sense to you? It doesn't to me. However, I think we have to appreciate that the Bible was inspired by God into people who then wrote it. It wasn't dictated. They didn't hear a voice in their ears. Just like you and me, it's the same. Aren't we moved by God in the heart? When we say we believe in something, it's in our mind, but it's also in our heart. And when it gets here, this is where it transforms. This is where it does stuff to us. And so when we try to tell others what God wants from us and what it means, we interpret it and we put it into our words to the best of our ideas. And so they say the creation story is beautiful, um, but, you know, because of the creation story, the entire universe, we believed that the earth was flat until Columbus sailed the ocean blue in, 19, in 18, 1500, whatever, that song, 1492, yes. And then, he proved by experience it wasn't flat, and then... When we get satellites and go out into outer space, we can actually see it's a globe. And the sun is not circulating around the earth. The earth is circulating around the sun. And it blew everything apart. And Copernicus and Galileo were thrown out of the church for their wild ideas that were absolutely the truth. So we're dealing with that kind of complexity. And there is a big $2.50 word Anthro anthropological, I think that's the word. Uh, see, it's, it's so difficult, I can't, can't even remember it exactly. But this is what the word means, that we put on God our attributes and qualities. We see God like us instead of we seeing us like God. And that's what the book of Genesis said. We're made in the image and likeness of God. 
But, but don't we put on God, I think, anthropologically, these ideas? For example, if someone were to come up to you, like they did to Jesus, come up and spit in your face today when you walked in the market, what would that do to you? I asked you that last week. I know what it would do to me. It would, it would make me furious. and I probably want to spit back or say something awful or use a gesture that I can't use in church, and I won't. But that's what we do when we get offended. And let's face it, all of us have a, a tendency, maybe we've never done it, but sometimes we get hurt by somebody and hold on to that hurt for years. Never forgive them. And I think of the poor Palestinians in the Gaza Strip. What is it, 12,000 children have been killed? Uh, how will they ever recover from this? How will those people come out of this if there ever is a peace and ever forgive the Jews? How? how? I don't know. Certainly for generations, if not a century, there will be hatred, I think, for most people. That's how we think. That's what we do when injustice and hurt comes our way. So I think it's natural to think that God does the same. If we reject God, if we turn away from him, if we don't follow his commands, that he will punish us. And the scriptures are loaded with that in the Old Testament. The only time it changes, and when we finally get to John's first letter, way at the end of the Bible. This is around the year 100, 110. So it's about 60, 70, 80 years after the birth of Christianity. Finally, someone says with an absolute conviction, God is, God is love. That's who God is. God is love. And it says he or she who lives in love lives in God and God in him or her. And it finally it says, wherever there is love, there is God. So at some point, you've got to make up your mind what you believe. If you believe that God indeed wiped out all men and women on the earth except for eight people, be my guest. I won't be joining you, but I, I think uh, we put on God some of the lowest part of who we are. But rather, the Word of God, I think, is supposed to lift us up. Now, this is where today's scriptures become wildly wonderful. Mark is the briefest of all the Gospels and the briefest one at the beginning of Jesus' ministry. There's just three verses here today, and only one of them deals with him going out in the desert, not like Matthew and Luke, the temptations and Satan coming and, and, and making all these promises and Jesus... And there's all this drama around there, but not in Mark. It's just simply said. He, went out the, he was led by the Spirit into the desert among the wild animals. That was it. And then it goes and shifts to John the Baptist. Why was he led in the desert? The only reason I can think of is so that he could put his trust in God his Father. Um, what happened in the desert? And think of this if I were to suggest this to you. Okay, those of you who really want to be good Catholics, do this today. Go out into the desert. Don't take a jacket or, or if it warms up a whole bunch tomorrow, which it won't, uh, take some shorts and, 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 you know, light shirt. Don't take any food. Don't take any water. And stay there for 40 days. And make sure you go where there's wild animals. You would look at me and say, are you nuts? Are you nuts? What's the point of Jesus going to the desert under those conditions? He went there to become vulnerable. He went there to strip away everything that could protect and give him comfort. Why do that? Because when you trust under those conditions, it's a different kind of trust. I think that we go through life, most of us, trusting in money, Trusting in power, trusting in friendship, trusting in, in people's confidence in us. And we, I think we build lives that are meant to try to make us as secure as we can possibly be. And the truth is, you know, there are practically no guarantees in life. I have no guarantee that I'm going to be alive tonight. No guarantee. 
I hope I will be. I think I will be. It's probable that I should be, but I'm not certain. And about the only guarantee I know that that's absolutely certain, I guess it's absolute, is if somebody says when you buy something, this is a 100% money back guarantee if you don't like the product. That's the only one I know of that, that, that is sure if, if they're being honest and if they follow through on it. Those are a lot of ifs. But, but when people say that, I think it's, it's pretty certain you're going to get it back. All of it. But other than that, even you go to the doctor, you're going to have heart surgery. There's no guarantee it's going to work. If you get cancer medicine, there's no guarantee it's going to work. If you have a child, there's no guarantee you're not going to have problems. You probably are going to have problems with the child, but that's all right. Uh, what you, you get married, is that a guarantee? And if you went into marriage thinking it would be this kind of love and life and unity and closeness and love, is there a guarantee that's what will happen? It seems to me the, the, uh, the other guarantee, other than a, a you know, 100% money back guarantee, is life is going to be tough. You're going to have struggles. All of us, uh, there's no guarantee that it's going to be peaceful all the time. And so in the gospel today, I think we're being taught something. And it's, it's incredible. Jesus, led by the Spirit of God, led by God's Spirit to a place of invulnerability or vulnerability. He's, he's led there to become as vulnerable as he can, take all the defenses, all the protections away, go out in that desert for 40 days and 40 nights. And again, this is a little extraordinary because the implication is they will have no food or water and you cannot live 40 days without water, clearly. But that's where he's at. And why? Because the message that he's been invited to understand and believe in is that God says, I will be with you always, always, no matter what. And I'll tell you when it becomes beautifully certain for me, especially it's in the anointing of the sick, when I go to people and anoint them and, and they know they're dying. Because a lot of people... I think, become aware, their body tells them, you're not going to make it. And when I go to anoint that person, and I see them smile, or I see a single tear come down their face, and I hear their amens, to me that's powerful. Because I hear them saying in that, it is my interpretation, that they're saying, Lord, I know you're with me. Even in death, you will walk me through this. I believe you, Lord. You're always, always with me. That's where I think the scripture is leading us today, to trust that, to believe that. Now, I'll tell you my desert. Um, true in this lab. Here 12 years ago, I could run down this aisle. I could skip. I could probably do some flips coming down the aisle. I'm, if I make it all the way down the aisle without tripping, I say, I'm lucky today. I don't know about you. I'm 73, and I don't know if you have the same experience I have with balance. I mean, and just walking, it, it is not an easy thing. These legs do not want to even lift. They are as heavy as an elephant's leg. And it's just life. And I find old age, and I'm there, I find old age is, ugh, what a desert. What a desert. And every day I wake up, and if there's not a new pain, the pain is just still there. And I believe that God is with me and God loves me and, and I turn to God constantly. But uh, I find myself in the desert. And I think that when you're young and, you know, and you're building your life, you don't think that way. But I think as we get, they say, the second half of life over 50, but wait till 70. Don't even tell me at 50 what you're thinking. Wait till you're 70 and, and you begin to know what this is really about. Now, the question is, Perry Liker, do you trust even more in God? That's all I got. You know, I, I, I love my doctors and all, but they tell me all kinds of things. And I'm taking so many pills, they're probably popping out my ears, you know. But I don't, I don't trust that those pills are going to do everything they say they will do. And look at every, every single television commercial about medicine 
Ozampa, Wampampa, Papa Dupa, and it does this, 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 but it also can kill you. <laughs> it also has all these side effects. Really, that's something to put your trust in, isn't it? And so what's left? I think at the deepest part of our spirit, it's to do what Jesus did, to go out into the desert alone and face ourselves and face God all alone. And Jesus tells us that he trusted in the Father. He trusted in his God. And I think if that's where we're being led, and if that's what happens to us, we're pretty blessed people. And that, to me, is a pretty good sign that God indeed is and has been faithful to his promises.